Hello and welcome to uh, the New York City Category Theory Seminar. Today we have Astra Komatskaya talking about this displayed type theory and semi simplicial types. You, you want the lights off this more? Is okay. Perfect. Go. Take right. it away. So, uh, two Novembers ago, I gave a talk about how I spent four months proving that 2 plus 2 equals 4. This time, I'm giving a talk about how I spent two years answering the question what is a triangle? <laughs> um, so, to start off, we're going to talk about shapes, kindergarten shapes, cube, simplex, globe. Triangle means simplex. So first off, we have to like get our fundamental shape category in place. Um, so consider a category which will be known as the semi-simplex category. Its objects are natural numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3. A natural number represents a stack of n plus 1 elements. So the number 0 represents 1 element, the number 2 represents 2 elements in a stack, and the morphisms are the order-preserving injections. So for example, if we have the numbers 2 and 4, then 2 is a stack of 3 items, 4 is a stack of 5 items, and an order-preserving injection, here's an example of it. That it's order-preserving means the arrows can't cross in the middle, that it's an injection means they can't cross at their endpoints. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So let's consider a pre-sheaf on this category. In other words, we're going to assign to every single number a set, and this is going to be a set of simplices. Suppose that we have a two-simplex, so something in A2 of that pre-sheaf. What does its boundary look like? So you can, um, how many ways are there to include uh, two elements into three elements? In other words, maps from one to two. Well, you miss one of the points, so there's three of them. How many ways is there to include one element and three elements? Three ways. You just choose which one to go. Um, and so the boundary is like this. In other words, a triangle has three boundary lines and three boundary points shared in common between those lines. Now, if we look at this diagram, it sort of looks like a Hasse diagram. So an example of semi-simplicial uh, semi sets is computer graphics. In computer graphics, you have points, and then if you have two points, there's at most one unique line joining them that's just the straight line. And you might or may not have simplices that are being rendered on the screen, uh, but a simplex is just defined whether it's filled in or not by its boundary points. Um, and so if we imagine that there's like three underlying points in three space A, B, C, we could consider the points as being just defining one of those things, and we can consider the lines as being two elements sets of two up points. What, what, what's, what's missing? Yes, exactly. What's missing? For to be a simplicial sets. There's something missing. To complete this picture, we really want to add the empty sets in this Hasse diagram. Mm -hmm. um, and this would be a negative one simplex, so to speak. Was that your question? No, you no. said semi-simplicial. Right, so I want to know what's the difference ah, between semi-simplicial right. sets and simplicial sets. So in a simplicial set, there's a notion of a degeneracy. And the idea is that you can turn a point into a degenerate line. Sort of, if we think about the three-space example, it would be a line that's just concentrated at one point during this entire duration. Um, so for a technical reason, uh, I want to solve the problem of semi-simplicial sets. So if we actually go to the category, I'm considering the category of order-preserving injections. Oh, yeah, if we injections. drop the injectivity condition, then we have the simplex category. Right. So the difference is whether they're an injection or not. Order preserving is going to be maintained in both cases. Okay, so 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 you don't have cofaces, or you don't have faces, depending on which way you're looking at it. No. Right. Okay. I just have points, lines, triangles, tetrahedra, nothing else. Okay. Okay, and you're going to tell us later why the technical reason why you couldn't do it with yeah. I mean. With simplicial sets. I couldn't. I. <laughs> do expect us to do it, not in this talk, but in general. Um, I'll explain why the problem has, the famous open problem has been semi simplicial types, and I'll explain an approach to it. Um, to simplicial types, after I explain the solution to semi simplicial types. So, um, yeah, if we look at this lattice diagram, something's missing. And sort of, we want something in dimension negative one. So if you think about a triangle, three points, three lines, a filled in triangle, where are you drawing this? You're drawing it on a page. The negative one dimensional simplex is the page on which the drawing is taking place. So um, the semi-simplex category doesn't have an initial object, but if you add a negative one dimensional 
object to it, so the natural number starting from negative 1, that represents a stack of one item, um, of zero items, sorry, negative 1 plus 1 is 0, and there's a unique map from zero elements to any other stack, right? Mm -hmm. So by adding an initial object to the category, we obtain the augmented semi-simplex category. And yeah, so delta is the semi-simplex category, delta plus is the augmented semi-simplex category. So what is a pre-sheaf on this, a pre-sheaf meaning valued in sets is known as a semi-simplicial set. And what's another way to present the data of that? <coughs> well, the idea is um, if you sort of have a simplex and it has a bunch of vertices, uh, you can imagine face maps which sort of delete one of the vertices and pass to the face opposite that vertex, right? Now, if you have a triangle and you pass to one of the lines and then you pass to one of its endpoints, or you pass to a different line and then pass to its endpoint such that it's the same point, those two deletions, orders of deleting uh, uh, two different vertices, results in the same face, co-dimension two face. Um, and so if you just give sets and you give these face maps, there's an identity saying that um, Basically, if you first delete the bigger one and then the smaller one, it's the same as though had you first deleted the smaller one and then deleted the bigger one, except now things are moved over by one because that vertex is gone. Um, and this formulation is what I'll call fibered, as opposed to what I will later call indexed. And the reason is that like all of the triangles, all of the lines, they're all together in one big space. And then you're saying how it's fibered mm -hmm. over simplices of the previous dimension. So, the problem of semi-simplicial types is roughly the problem of semi-simplicial spaces. Instead of a pre sheaf valued in sets, we want a pre sheaf valued in homotopy types. And so what's going to happen is that previously we had these uh, simplicial identities, well, the semi-simplicial identity, and now we want to say that they're equal. But what does equality mean in the homotopy category? It means they're homotopic. And the problem with a homotopy is that a homotopy is a deformation. It's like a particular motion, and that carries data. How do you deform something into something? So um, the entire idea of homotopy type theory is we thought very deeply about the notion of equals. And it's not just that two things are equal and that's the end of the yeah. story. Um, equality can carry data. Yeah. But if you have this data, you sort of want to put constraints on it. And I can explain why you want to put constraints on it um, in a bit. Those are going to be coherence. Regardless. Exactly. So suppose you want to pass to a co-dimension 3 face of a simplex. So you're deleting three different vertices. Um, so if you delete them in increasing order versus in decreasing order, um, then there's actually two different ways to go from one ordering to the other ordering. Um, and that can be represented by an equation like this. So there's whiskering, and I wrote this equation down. Um, I also think those dots are a typesetting issue. Those dots should be composition operations between okay. them. Got it. Um, so this is alpha whiskered by delta composed, delta whiskered by alpha composed. Um, but anyway, this formula isn't important. What's important is the picture. Um, so passing from this uh, one permutation in increasing order to one permutation in decreasing order, you can swap either the first two first or the last two first. Um, and so we'd like to say that if you take these two deformations, one deformation should be deformable into the other deformation. So, so you have some simplex and you have you have you want to delete three different the things across from three different points so you have six different possibilities of exactly doing that. and there's some type of morphism between those okay. yeah so these are like functions the face maps and the morphisms represent a deformation from a composition of three functions to another composition of three functions and and there's going to be higher permutahedron? Yeah, so this is known as a three permutahedron. What happens if there's four deletions? If there's four deletions, it looks like this. This is known as a four permutahedron. Mm -hmm. It's a three-dimensional polyhedron. The vertices are labeled by the permutations on four elements. Mm -hmm. This picture isn't the ideal picture, but like one way that you can say when two permutations are adjacent is if you can relate one to another by transposition of adjacent elements only. 
And I said that writing down a formula for the required homotopy is very difficult, except I recently did it. Good. And I was going to say that no one was going to write down a formula for the permutahedron in the next dimension, except I'm probably the person that's going to do that. So, Good. <laughs> okay, so what's the idea behind semi-simplicial types as a problem in type theory? Uh, the thing is that like these coherences, they seem like a losing strategy. You're going to have to encode this as like an equation. For the last equation, it looked like this, mm -hmm. and that was already painful. Uh, this is more painful. Um, encoding all of these coherences isn't the way that you want to go around, and it turns out that there's an approach that completely avoids the oh. coherences. And that's known as indexing. So the idea behind indexing is that previously we had all of the lines together in a whole space of lines, and that was by fibered over the points. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with a notion of points. These are just a type, so they're a space. We have a space of points. Um, for lines, we're going to split up all of the spaces and index them by their two boundary points. So for every two definite boundary points, we have a space of lines joining them. At the next level, we have triangles. So what are triangles indexed? They're indexed by three points and three lines. Um, so this is using type theory notation, but the point is for every three points, those are the x's, and for every three lines, those are the betas, we have a type of triangles. Nitex dimension up, we have tetrahedra. Is there a reason why you wrote the third point after? Yes. Um, look at the subscripts. 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. Gotcha. There's a pattern. There is, of course, a pattern, right? And so one would like to say that a semi-simplicial type is a notion of points, a notion of lines, a notion of triangles, a notion of tetrahedra, and so on. So there's an ellipsis. The problem, of course, <laughs> has been the ellipsis. This has been the most open, uh, important open problem in type theory for the past decade, uh, originally posed by Vladimir Wojewodski. Mm -hmm. No one has been able to define these in type theory. And this is a very surprising state of affairs because there's obviously a pattern to the shape of this data. The binary numbers indicate it. Mm -hmm. But why can't you do it? Well, the answer is like secretly, if you try and do it, uh, in order to make your construction well typed, you have to prove some lemma about the construction. Then you try and prove the lemma, and you have to prove another lemma about the proof of the very lemma. Sure. Then you have to prove another lemma about the proof of the proof of the lemma, and so you get an infinite tower of theorems that you have to prove and they blow up exponentially in complexity. And like secretly, this problem is no easier to solve in index formulation than in the fibered formulation. If you try and do it in code, then exactly the permutahedron coherence has come up. So the problem is, how do we do infinitely coherent structures in type theory? In type theory, you can talk about categories, which are like set theoretics, so they're homotopy sets. You have a set of objects, you have a set of morphisms. That's a two-layered structure. But what about infinity categories? Infinity categories are infinitely layered structures. And so far, basically, no one has analytically defined, in type theory, a notion of an infinitary structure. Um, and the barrier to doing this has been known as the infinite coherence barrier. There's no weak end categories. I mean, there's no normal, there's no agreed upon definition of what a weak end category is. Like, and so the problem is that, like, what's a pre sheaf, right? A pre sheaf is functorial, right? What is functoriality? That's an equality. So if you're working with sets, two things are equal, and that's the end of the story. But if you're working in types, then to define a functor, you really want to talk about functors between infinity categories. Um, so type theory, it, every, the, well, you can only say things up to homotopy, and category theoretically, unless you make things sets, you can only say things infinity categorically, and there are just no one's been able to define infinity categories in type theory. So how did we do it? Suddenly, uh, the objective uh, meta theory of simply typed lambda calculus part two. So last time that I gave a talk, I gave a talk about simple type theory. I ask the question, what is simply type lambda calculus? And in order to answer that question, I ask the question, what is a type theory? And I told you what a type theory was for a simple type theory. Well, I said next time I talk about dependent type theory, so here's next time. What is a dependent type theory? I'm not assuming that 
anyone here knows about type theory. Um, and so I'm going to tell you what a type theory is. So what is a notion of space, like a setting for working in spaces? So there's axiomatizations like model categories or infinity topi. These are great settings for working in spaces. And in all of these settings, you have the notion of a vibration. So model categories have vibrations. And the idea behind indexing, or these dependent types, is basically this notion of vibrations. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about like a very specific notion that's equivalent to that of a model category. Well, it's not equivalent to that of a model category. Scratch that completely. Um, it's going to be clear that every single model category has this minimum amount of structure, as does any infinity topos. Um, so I'm just going to take this idea of like vibrations, and I'm going to axiomatize it into a different setting for spaces, and we're going to work formally with this setting in this talk. This setting is known as a category with families. So I can give the definition of the category used with families um, on this slide, and then we're going to take several slides to explain what it means. So first off, a category with families is just a category C to start off with, and then there's going to be two pre-sheaves. One is going to be the pre-sheaf of types on the category, and then a pre-sheaf of terms on the category of elements of types. So what does this mean? Uh, this means that for every object of C, we have a set of types. And the intuition there is that if we were working in a model category, this would be the set of vibrations over the type. And then terms for a vibration, these would be the sections of that vibration. So um, if, uh, as I'll get to in a second, we'll refer to objects as contexts. We're going to call them things like gamma. So for every object gamma, there is tie gamma. And if A is in tie gamma, then you can talk about terms of type A in context gamma. That's the set. Well, what's the integral sign? Uh, category of elements. So if you have any pre-sheaf, um, the category of elements is pairs of, the objects are um, an object one. of C and a type, and then the morphisms are morphisms between the objects of C such that it happens that if you pull back the second one, you get the first one. Okay, there's one more piece of structure, and this structure is like, we're going to get a lot of juice from this. Um, so if you consider the following pre-sheaf, um, we want that it's representable, and we want to choose a representation for every such pre-sheaf. So these pre-sheafs are defined by some object gamma and some type and context gamma. Um, and so the idea is, like, from any other context, uh, the value of the pre-sheaf on that context is a morphism from delta to gamma, as well as a term of type A pulled back by sigma. So sigma is delta to gamma. So if you have a type in context gamma, you get a type in context delta. Um, and the intuition behind this is, so, well, I'll explain it in a second. But anyway, we, want, we claim that these pre-sheaves are representable and that we've chosen a specific representation for every such pre-sheaf, and these pre-sheaves are indexed by gamma and A. So for notation, the objects of the category C are going to be called contexts, and we're typically going to denote them by delta or gamma. These are just the objects in your model category. Um, we are going to write gamma context to say that gamma is a context, and for the, oh, I forgot to mention, uh, the category has a chosen terminal object. Right? So for the chosen terminal object, we're going to denote it by this pair of parentheses. So the empty context is a context, and that's our chosen terminal object. So morphism sub C are going to be called substitutions, and we're typically going to denote them by sigma and tau. And then, so if we write the usual category theoretic notion, sigma from delta to gamma, and since we have uh, the terminal context, there is a unique substitution into it from any other context, and we're going to denote that with these square brackets. Any questions? And the delta has nothing to do with delta before. No, um, it's in blue, not in red. Oh, okay. 
It's, uh, so uh, my uh, color scheme is variables versus defined notions. Delta here is a variable, not a defined notion. And the one? Uh, uh, that's uh, not yeah. a variable. That's a defined notion okay. for the terminal object. I, I do have a question. Yeah. Uh, when you say chosen terminal object, I'm not familiar with the idea of a chosen terminal object. Um, is that just, in other words, we're just going to take what, any object in there and just call it? Oh, so a terminal object is a defined by categorical universal. Well, I understand what a terminal object is. I mean, well, we're by trying to find up to isomorphism. That's the whole point. There's a lot of terminal objects. So he wants one of them. Oh, okay. well, isomorphic, you have to pick one. Okay, got it. And we're also choosing uh, specific representations okay. for these pre-sheets. Mm -hmm. So there is some like strict structure here. Okay. Okay, so elements of the pre-sheet pi are called types, and we're typically going to denote them by A or B, and here's where I introduce the most interesting piece of notation that's going to go through this talk. Um, so we're going to use this turn style symbol. We're going to write for A and tie gamma that in context little gamma is in big gamma, a gamma is a type. And the reason that I'm writing the little gamma after A is to indicate exactly how A depends as a vibration on the object over which it's fibered. So think model category. Theoretically, gamma is an object. A is a vibration over the object. And to denote the explicit dependence of how it's fibered, I'm going to write this gamma after that. So vibrations are just types. We're just talking about like a model category and the vibrations of the model category. Oh. <laughs> I mean, not that's not the actual setting. We're not going to have the full structure of a model category, but this is what you think. Yeah, so just the, the, so, 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 the other, I got to read this because the other types are not going to be any. Ray type. No, we ray. Okay, fine. Sorry. Next off, terms. So if we have in context gamma some vibration A, and we take a section of that vibration, then that's going to be called a term. And we're going to write like little lowercase tns for terms. And to use type theoretic notation, we're going to write that in context little gamma is in big gamma, t gamma. So we're also indicating how the term depends on the object which you're sectioning is a term of type A gamma. Mm -hmm. So the colon is saying is a term of type. Mm -hmm. And geometrically, think sections of vibration. Uh, if you were to put parentheses there, where would the parentheses go? Um, so uh, the turn style is the top level thing. Right. So um, the left hand side is a context with variable mm -hmm. bindings. And then on the right hand side, we have that T gamma together is a term of type A gamma. So around T gamma and around A gamma. Okay, thank you. Also, uh, because it's a pre sheaf, we have functorial actions on these things. So if we have a type in context gamma and we have a substitution from delta to gamma, then we can pull back A to context delta. Um, so these are inference rules, and you're going to be seeing a lot of them. It says, supposing that we have the data on the top, then we get the data on the bottom. So the first one says, supposing we have a substitution from delta to gamma and A, a type in context gamma, then in context delta, um, we have that A. So usually I write this A superscript sigma to denote the pullback, but I'm going to actually think of delta as like variables and of sigma as a function, and I'm going to evaluate the function on the variables. Okay. So that's my notation for it. And similarly for terms, t if phi, so how is like t pulled back by sigma fibered over delta? So if you actually think of it as like a function that returns the fiber over a given point, although there aren't points, um, then you sort of evaluate, take the point in delta, you'd evaluate sigma on it, mm -hmm. get to a point in gamma, and then evaluate t on it to get to the fiber over it. Okay, so now we have this hypothesis that every, for such, every gamma and a, a type in context gamma, the following um, is representable. I'm just going to explain what this means over the next couple of slides. So first off, if it's representable and there's a chosen representation, then there is a chosen representing object. 
that object is known as the context extension. So the idea is if we have a object in a model category and a vibration over it, we can form the total space of the vibration. Um, and that's going to be the context extension. So if we think in logic, gamma is like a set of assumptions, then we've added a point in the fibers over that. And so we've sort of added an assumption, which is a variable A. And so these open parens, they denote contexts. And I can build a bigger context from a context gamma by extending by A. It's like a homotopy lifting problem. Yeah, exactly. So what does the representation say? Um, the represent if this is a representing object, then morphisms from delta to that has to be equivalent to the data on the right. So how do you map from delta to gamma, the total space of gamma A? You map to the base space, then you pull back the vibration over the map to the base space, and then you section it over there. So that's exactly what it says. So we have a natural family of bijections, as I was just saying. And by Yoneda, this is determined by entirely by evaluating at the identity on the extended context, right? So if we plug in the identity on the extended context on the left, and remember, delta it can be anything here. We're saying this is a natural family of bijections in delta. So set delta to be the extended context, plug in the identity, we get two things from it, right? On the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. The first thing is called the parent map. Um, it's going to be a substitution from the extended context down to the base. So this is a projection from the total space to the base space, right? And the second one is a zero variable. So that's a term of type A pulled back by the parent map in the extended context. Um, and later on, we're not going to write this parent map. We're not going to write this thing, really what we want to write is in gamma, in context gamma, comma, a, little a is a term of type a, but to be perfectly formal about it, we're saying that zero variable is a term of a pulled back to the extended context, weakened, to also depend on a trivially. Mm -hmm. So that's our zero variable. So we have parent maps and zero variables. Now that it's a bijection, Oh, also, uh, we, so we said what this is evaluates to on the identity map. Those are those two components. By Yoneda, this, by Yoneda, this determines the entire bijection completely. So for an arbitrary tau, um, the left to right direction of the bijection sends tau to tau composed with the parent map on the left and the zero variable pulled back by tau. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, that it's a bijection means we have a map going in the other direction. So in other words, if I say how to map from delta to the base space gamma, and then I pull back the fibers to delta and I section that, then I should have a way to map from delta to the extended context, right? And this operation is known as substitution extension. So square brackets are always like substitution land and open brackets are always um, context land. So that's like a good notational dichotomy. And so in the same way that you can extend context, you can extend substitutions by terms. You can extend a context by a type, you can extend a substitution by a term. Now, that it's a bijection. I've already told you what the maps are in both directions, right? So to say that it's a bijection means two things. Well, it means three things because one of the things lives in a pair. Um, but so for any sigma and any term t uh, sectioning the pullback vibration, um, we have that if you sort of project from an extended substitution, you just get the original substitution. And if you take the zero variable and pull it back by the extended substitution, you get t. So substituting into a zero variable with a specific term gives you that term. And then in the reverse direction, if we take a uh, substitution from delta to the extended context, I can basically get its components um, by composing with the parent map and pulling back the zero variable. And then if I pair those two things to get, extend the substitution, I should get the original substitution again. So that just follows from this step being a bijection. So 
one thing that I want to point out is sub, um, the fibrate the parent maps um, in a model category. This would be the vibrations, and vibrations are like a special class of morphisms. So if, when I write a parent map uh, or a fundamental context projection, I'll denote it with this triangle arrow to indicate that it's special. So in a model category, it's not the case that all pullbacks exist, but pullbacks of vibrations exist and are vibrations, right? Now, as it happens, if I have any vibration, in other words, a fundamental context projection or a parent map, then I can actually construct a pullback square explicitly using the ingredients that I'm given. I'm sorry, did you say uh, pullbacks don't always exist? In a model category, we don't assume that pullbacks of arbitrary morphisms along arbitrary morphisms exist. In a model category, you only have that pullbacks of vibrations along arbitrary morphisms exist. Don't we normally ask that they have finite limits? Small categories? Oh, uh, in, in like vibrantly, I think. Yeah, I'm sure the usual actions have have the thing being being complete. However, I mean, what you said sounds a lot like the original motivation for model category where the model, you know, fibrant versus co-fibrant, which were words you vibration. I, I, I'm just sorry, are you, are you thinking about homotopy limits and homotopy? Because that takes one No, model. just ordinary, just a definition of a model category, whether it's a JL model category or original model category. Yeah, people have different conventions. Typically, though, I, I think they normally have finer limits. Yeah. So I'm not a homotopy theorist, so I'm not going to claim okay. this authoritatively, <laughs> but I know that like the operation that one usually does is pull back vibration yeah, to arbitrary sure. morphisms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> here, we have a distinguished choice of pullbacks of vibrations along arbitrary morphisms, mm -hmm. and you can just calculate that this choice of pullbacks is definitionally functorial. Um, so what is like a structure of a category with families relative to a model category? It has some strictness. We took pre-sheaves. Pre-sheaves are functorial, right? Um, so for any model category, if you sort of choose definitionally functorial pullbacks for all of your vibrations, you can present such a structure. But you, can, you, can you always do that? In general, you can uh, find a um, model category which is homotopy equivalent to it for which that holds. And how you do that is basically do a fiber replacement operation where you replace the vibrations with like pairs of a vibration and a pullback along which you're pulling it back. Okay. And those two categories are homotopy equivalents. And if you want that structure on your original category, you can use coherence theorems. Gotcha. I'm not following at that level. But well, I'm listening. So anyway, <laughs> this is what dependent type theory is. You can review the video afterwards and uh, yeah, have more time. So well, what's dependent type theory? We have vibrations, which are types. Types depend on a context. So there's like a vibrant dependence. There's substitution. You can pull back types. There's projections. There's zero variables. You can extend substitutions. Um, some laws hold. That's it. That's what a dependent type theory is. You now know about dependent type theory. Last time I told you about, yeah. I'm sorry. Just repeat, please, just literally the last sentence or two you just said. Sure. Um, so, what is dependent type theory? Dependent type theory, you have a category. I'm going to rephrase it. And then you have fibrin structure over the category. Uh, these are these types and these terms. Uh, what's the fibrin structure like? Well, you can pull it back along morphisms downstairs in the base category. Right. Um, you have these projections, uh, parent maps, and then you have these zero variables. And then there's some definitionally functorial structure. So like the fundamental idea of like, if a type is like a syntactic expression that depends on some variables and then a substitution is like made out of terms, you just replace the variables with those terms is the idea. And sort of that sort of syntactic operation is what I'm suggesting with the notation that I'm using for types and terms. Uh, but you can see that like an arbitrary model category satisfies the structure, right? So when type theorists do type theory, just think about we want lo to use logic to reason about model categories. Mm -hmm. And model categories are inherently dependent because you have vibrations yeah. over a context. So that's what dependent type theory is. And it's great. And we can reason in categories. Mm -hmm. Like in set theory, the models are model theory, they're also like set theoretic, but in type theory, the models are always categories. It's categorical logic. Categorical logic is the type theory equivalent of model theory for set theory. 
Great. Uh, so now, what did I talk about last time? So I, for at least spent four months proving 2 plus 2 equals 4, but the idea was that I proved a normalization theorem, which is what we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. And how could I prove the normalization theorem? So the idea is, I said what a model of simple type theory is, and I said what a model of simple type lambda calculus is. The syntactic model is the initial such model, and then for any model, any arbitrary model, we constructed a new model. And that model was a twisted gluings model. And then sort of going from one model to the other, let me prove this normalization theorem in a purely category theoretic way with using no properties of syntax. So I proved the theorem for any initial contextual Cartesian closed category or freely generated one um, without reference to syntax by pure category theory. But like the ingredient there was going from an arbitrary model to the model of twisted gluings. In this talk, we're basically going to do the same thing. We're going to start with an arbitrary model of dependent type theory, and we're going to construct a new model. This model is known as the simplicial model, and it's a general instance of a diagram model. So what's this idea behind this diagram model? Well, suppose C is some category of families. Think model category. Um, I want to construct a diagram model, which in this notation looks like uh, pre-sheaves valued in C on the augmented semi-simplex category. So I'm going to use the augmented semi-simplex category in this section. Now, um, so as a category, the non-fibrant structure, if we just think about the non-fibrant structure, the underlying category of this diagram model is C value pre in on delta plus, right? But then we need to say what the fibrant structure is. And how does one say what the fibrant structure is on a pre model? The answer is that there's a general thing known in the literature as the Reedy model construction. So if you have any model category and you take pre on a Reedy category, then there's a model structure on that. Aren't, there, aren't there, two, there two models, or is that the, something else? It's like the, you think of injective projects. Right, those okay. always exist. Uh, so if it's a Reedy category, do the injective and projective model structures agree? I don't know. Anyway, let's look it up on that lab later. <laughs> um, but like Reedy categories are special. Um, but also, in general, like the augmented semi-simplex category isn't just a Reedy category, it's an inverse category. So there's only positive maps, there's no negative maps. And in that case, it's even nicer. Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you mean by negative maps? So in a Reedy map, every map factors as like a positive map with a negative map in one of the two directions, I don't remember which. Uh, like, like think the augmented semi-simplex category. Um, if you have a map or an order-preserving way between two ordinals, you first factor it as a surjective map, identifying all of the things, and then as an injective map. So the fact that there's a unique such factorization uh, is what makes it a Reedy category. But in, in this case, we don't actually have like any non-trivial surjections. Yeah. Right. Um, so it's an inverse category. Now, I am not going to just use the Reedy model category structure from the literature. The key of the display type theory paper is that we are going to give a bespoke construction of this model structure that's specific to the augmented semi-simplex category. We're going to look at this construction, we're going to make a type theory out of it. So I'm going to tell you what, <laughs> how to construct um, this uh, model category C delta plus. So that's called the diagram model. So to give things... And this is going to be um, a, uh, a full up standard Quillen model structure? It's going to be a category with families. So okay. we're going to go from one category of families to another Okay, so the families. model structure here is not model structure in, in the stand, in the homotopy model structure sense. It's not a Quillen model structure. It's a model of category homotopy. with families. Okay, so the same construction that I use can be rewritten in the language of model categories, but I'm going to do it with categories with families. I said at the beginning that there's like several notion of spaces. There's like okay. model categories, there's infinity topi, and then the third alternative, which I'm using in this talk, is categories with families. Okay. So we're all we're just going to work with categories of families. All right. Mm -hmm. Did you talk about vibrations and co-fibrations? No co-fibrations, only vibrations, oh, and vibrations are your types. Right. So we don't have like the full structure of a model category. We don't have yeah, co-fibrations. So, 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 yeah, we so the way we build it is very different than building a QMC. That's the main thing I want to get. Mm, sure. Uh, well, uh, why did you say we only, 
your your deltas only have injections, so your delta, so your seat of the delta ops only have vibrations. Um. No. Um. If C were a full model category, then um, we could construct another model category for any Reedy category, independent of whether it's inverse or Reedy. Um, I'm just starting with only a category with family structure on C, not like, I've been using this analogy, think model categories, but what I actually mean is category with families. Mm -hmm. So model category here is a word, substitute for category with families, and I'm saying it's to make the homotopy theorist comfortable. Uh, yeah, yeah. Or when, when you read model category, Except read, when you read, make them read, 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 um, <laughs> read model of type theory category, yeah. as opposed to model category in any other sense. Yeah. So we're going to give these names. The original category with families, or the original model of type theory, is going to be known as the discrete model. And on the augmented semi-simplex category, the diagram model is going to be known as the simplicial model. So we're starting with a discrete model. It's an arbitrary categories with families. And we want to construct a, the simplicial model, which is another category with families. Now, in order to do this, um, I'm actually going to construct what are called the truncated um, simplicial models. And by simplicial, I always mean semi-simplicial. I'm just dropping the word semi everywhere. Um, so you can take the full category of the augmented semi-simplex category on objects less than a certain object. Remember that the um, objects are natural numbers starting with negative one. Um, and in fact, we can do this for any n greater than or equal to negative two. So negative two isn't an object. So the full subcategory on objects that are less than or equal to negative two is the empty category. And the pre-sheaf category on that is just the units. Um, structure. So there's like a trivial um, Anyway, uh, if you evaluate a pre-sheaf on negative 2, which is an object that doesn't exist, you just get the chosen terminal object. Mm -hmm. You don't actually get a set that you're choosing there. It's just mm -hmm. trivial structure and, structure and dimension negative 2. But these truncated things, they don't have the problem because you're not going up all dimensions. You're going to stop at some point. I'm going to eventually take the limits, but I'm going to define the pattern there. So I'm doing the construction in like a uniform way, and then eventually I'm just going to... So I should mention that what I'm doing right now is not solving the problem of semi-simplicial types. The reason I'm solving the problem basically in semantics, and the semantics is set theoretic. So before I solve the problem in syntax and actually construct semi-simplicial types in type theory, I'm going to do stuff about models of type theory in order to actually give the appropriate setting. And I'm going to do something that really looks like I'm constructing semi-simplicial types, but it's not a construction of semi-simplicial types. It's happening in a set theoretic meta theory. But that's the first step. So, um, okay, if we have uh, C delta plus N. This is the truncated thing of, on numbers up to n. For negative 2, it's uh, the empty category. And um, the pre-sheaves on it, well, there's a unique pre-sheaf on an empty category. There is actually a thing. And then the fibrant structure is the terminal fibrant structure. So there's only a single type over your single object, and there's a single section of it. There's no information there. So if we have anything in dimension negative two, there's just no information there. Okay, so I now need to give, like I presented what the augmented semi-simplex category was using stacks of objects, right? Um, but now I'm going to give a bit of more of an algebraic presentation. So if you think of one stack of objects and another stack of objects, and you think of a morphism which are arrows, some of the objects get hit on the right. Um, now we're going to, if it gets hit, we're going to write a 1. If it doesn't get hit, we're going to write a 0, and we're going to read those numbers up. So um, the objects are going to be natural numbers starting from negative 1. We're going to do an angle bracket k. Um, then we have binary digits, 0 and 1. 1 is not the terminal object. 1 is now a binary digit. There's two uses of the same symbol. Uh, now for any two numbers bigger than negative 1, we have morphisms um, from the, so this is going to be from the um, 
smaller number m to the bigger number n. So this is morphisms from m to n. Um, and so n represents a stack of n plus 1 items. So a morphism from m to k is a sequence of n plus 1 binary digits, of which exactly m plus 1 have the value 1. So if you have this string, um, then some of the things got hit by things in the previous thing. Um, and how many things got hit? Uh, one less than that is the actual dimension of the object from which you are mapping. Then you can define composition by, if you take two binary numbers, you replace all the ones in the um, one which you're doing second with the digits of the first one. Uh, but I can give a more algebraic presentation of what the composition operation is, which is for binary numbers, we can left and right append uh, digits to like shift both dimensions by one. So the identity is going to be given by a string of ones. And then these laws are familiar if you've worked with basically subsets. So this is how composition works. I'm sorry, what, what, are, you what are you defining right now? Uh, the augmented semi-simplex category. So I presented at the very beginning of the talk this presentation in terms of stack of objects and injective morphisms. Oh, okay. This is a purely algebraic formulation of that. And B? Uh, uh, binary digits. Is, is that the HOM sets? Or? Um, so B superscripts NM right here, uh, that's the HOM set. Oh, yeah, okay. And uh, the HOM set is sets of n plus 1 binary digits of which m plus 1 are the digit 1. So what's happening in that definition? I'm trying to turn that bottom thing into just like code in my, like normal code in my head. Sure. Um, so there are injections, right? right? So if you first inject into a stack of elements and then, so what is inserting 0 at the bottom of an injection doing? Um, Oh, zero doesn't increase both dimensions. Zero just increases the codomain thing. So what zero is, is you take like two stacks of elements and arrows between them, and you add an uh, element at the bottom of the second stack, right? Uh, one is you add an element to both stacks at the bottom, and then you connect them with an arrow. So what this says is if you first do an injection, and then you compose with something that you get by like adding something at the bottom of a stack, well, that element isn't going to get hit. So it's the same as just composing them and then adding the elements at the bottom. Oh, okay, so these are identities. These are identities. Uh, okay, so, okay, so you have your 1B and your 0 of your generators for the thing, because I can factor Yeah, because you can write any those. start of the empty string and append zeros okay. and ones. So I keep adding zeros to the number, right? Yeah. I, I want to have one side. Yeah, okay. Any binary string is built out of digits. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's pretty cool. Okay, so uh, the categorical structure. Um, we are constructing this category with families. And first, I'm going to say what the underlying category is, and then I'm going to tell you what the fiber structure is. So the underlying category of the um, truncated simplicial model is a C value pre sheaf on the truncated um, augmented semi simplex category. So that it's a pre sheaf means that for any m greater than or equal to negative 2, there exists a um, evaluation of that pre sheaf on the number m. Um, so notice, by the way, for <coughs> notation, um, I refer to objects as gamma context. I'm now going to add a subscript here to say that this is a context <coughs> in the truncated simplicial model at n. So if gamma is a context at the SMN and I have a number M, then gamma M. By the way, M has to be less than N. I forgot to write that. You can't evaluate on bigger numbers. Mm -hmm. um, but gamma M is a context in the discrete model because they're C valued pre -sheaves. They're valued in the original model. Um, and then if we evaluate the number negative 2, we get the chosen terminal objects, which is what I said before. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, pre-sheaves have actions of morphisms on them, so there's a way to act on binary digits. So if I, if I have an injection from m plus 1 elements to n plus 1 elements, then I get a way to pull back the bigger set gamma n to the face set gamma m. So these are your face maps. Um, now, if we have like small gamma, which will be bound in a context, then we want to denote the pullback of it. 
by the this morphism gamma b, I'll sometimes just write a superscript b acting on like the variables gamma to denote the fallback. Good. Okay, so there are two functors of relevance. These functors will go from truncated models to truncated models of one dimension lower. So remember, we're talking about purely non-fibrant structures, so we're talking about pre-sheaves, no fibrant structure. So what can you do on, with a pre-sheaf that starts from negative 1 and goes up to n plus 1? You can forget the top one, right? So that's truncation. You're just forgetting the top level. There's another thing that you can do. You can forget the bottom one. Ah, okay. That's called decollage. Cool. And so how you do decollage is that your face maps, well, it's sort of the bottom vertex, now you can never delete it. So your face maps just don't touch the lowest vertex in the ordering. Um, so how like a binary digit acts is that it acts like that, but it always preserves the um, zero vertex in the ordering. So decollage is a backwards shift operator. Décalage means get undressed in French? Décalage means gap or shift in French. N oh, get undressed? <laughs> if you look it up on Wikipedia, if you look it up on Google Translate, it's shift or gap. Literally shift. It, it's just shift. It's a backwards shift operation. You call it shift yes. in French. Maybe that might have been like a slang type of thing. <laughs> this is Probably like a, a <laughs> classical <laughs> operation in um, simplicial homotopy theory. Right? What is that? It might be mine. That'd be terrible. I'm so embarrassed. Mine's usually turned off just to prevent. This can happen if you get it off. It's mine, I'm sorry. Um, Any questions in the meanwhile? Yeah, can, can you explain again um, the decollage, uh, how that... Right, so um, you if you think about the pre-sheaf, it has like negative one simplices, zero simplices, one simplices, mm -hmm. two simplices. In the decollaged object, the negative one simplices are now the zero simplices, the one simplices are now the two simplices. Oh, okay. So you everything shift shifts. everything down, and now you have to say how the face maps work. Mm -hmm. Well, you have fewer face maps than you have before at one of these, so mm -hmm. basically there's an undeletable vertex at this point. Yeah. Um, and so you can see that like the way that uh, binary number B acts on the pre-sheaf gamma D is that it acts on gamma by 1b. So mm -hmm. that's sort of the undeletable right. vertex. Now, the key thing is that there is a natural transformation from decollage to pi. Um, so if you shifted um, down by 1, you have like the top dimensional information. Uh, you can, and so here's the formula for the natural transformation. Um, the component on gamma, um, as spoiler alert, this will be the even substitution, as I'll call it later. So it basically takes all of the faces, the ones that survive are the ones that don't have a one in their first position, in like bias binary substrings. Mm -hmm. um, so it, we're going to see that decollage, if we sort of extend repeatedly, if we extend by a type, the decollage thing will extend by two types. And rho will basically discard the odd ones, the second ones in this order, it's in the zero index. Um, uh, well, what is it, how come there's no decollage in regular topology? There is. The, the, the NLAB article on decollage in simplicial homotopy theory, decollage is a fundamental operation. Where do you think we got the word from? French. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's a word, it's I mean, an establishment. It, this is like, I it's going to be called like de looping or something, right? Say, ah, de -looping. Yeah. Right? So it's, it's de-looping. Wow. Oh, okay. um, uh, well, my question here is, you're saying this is going to hit all the evens. Yeah. But th this only happens to the first object. So, uh, uh, like, when I do this, this is only hitting one thing, right? Not half a thing. So, um, okay. So we, we, at each level, uh -huh m plus 1, above, meaning above dimension negative 2 strictly, uh -huh. um, you want to get a map from gamma um, of m plus 2 to gamma m plus 1, right? Um, so we want to drop a dimension, so we have to like delete 
Um, oh, I see. Uh, uh, so you're not doing this just once. You're doing this at every M. And I'm that's why you're hitting each yes. thing. Yes. Okay. So it's a natural transformation, and then for every context gamma, there is a component of that natural transformation, which is a morphism of pre-sheaves, and I'm saying what that morphism of pre-sheaves is at every level, M plus 1. And this okay. map depends on M. So you can see this right-hand side uses M. Right. So this is, there's like, I, I'm doing two levels of like uh, pattern matching. I'm first eliminating on the pre-sheaf, and then I'm eliminating on the level because it's a morphism of pre-sheaves, okay. which is a map at every level. Okay, so so rho is the idea is that for every uh, declaration in one direction, I can also is a way of saying okay, I can um, forget in the other direction. Yeah, got it. So um, shifting by dropping the bottom information mm -hmm. and keeping the top dimensional information, you have more information there than if you completely forget the top dimensional information. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that that okay. These okay. Now I, are the fundamental players. Yeah. Truncation, decalage, and the evens projection, although I will not call it that until I explain why it is rho, the natural transformation from decalage to truncation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at the intuition. So the next two slides, I'm not going to do a rigorous construction. I just want to explain what I'm going to do. And it's going to look like what I'm trying to do is solve the problem of semi-simplicial types in semantics. So first off, I want to say what the fibered structure is. So I want to say what a type is over some pre-sheave gamma, right? So what is a type in the simplicial model at n plus 1? Well, a type is supposed to consist of m simplex type. So a type has a type of negative 1 simplices, because it's all augmented. Then it has a type of 0 simplices. The 0 simplices are being drawn on a page, right? So we need to know what page the 0 simplex lives over. Then we have 1 simplices. Well, one simplices are lines. They have two boundary points, and those two boundary points are on the same page, right? Um, so the idea is that, like, we have this context extension operation. Uh, if we have the pre-sheet gamma, we can evaluate it at a number, and we get an object in a discrete model. So notice that here, this is a judgment in the simplicial model, and what it consists of is judgments in the original discrete model. Um, so I get various contexts in the original discrete model by evaluating at different numbers on the pre-sheaf. And then I basically extend those by the previous simplex type in this augmented semi-simplicial pattern. So here we have a page and two points. At the next dimension, it would be a page, two points, a line, another point, another two lines for the boundary of a triangle given in the ordering that's with binary numbers. So in general, we're going to write for uh, the n plus 1 simplex type of A in the um, simplicial model at n plus 1, that the n plus 1 simplex type lives in the context of gamma n plus 1 extended by the matching object of pi A. So this simplicial pattern is going to be generated by this matching object, which is denoted by this subscript partial n plus 1 notation. Um, this takes something of data dimension up to n. Uh, so the boundary of an n plus 1 simplex only relies on the n simplex types. So that's why we drop the top dimensional information, because that's what we're defining after all. Um, so a key player is going to be this uh, matching object. That's going to be a key part in the construction. Okay, so that's what types are. What are terms? Basically, same deal. What's a term in the simplicial model at n plus 1? Well, the fact is, here, we already have sections, so the context isn't going to change. Instead, we sort of section the zero simplices, and then we get a section of, sorry, the negative 1 simplices, and then we get a section of the zero simplices. We can plug those in to the variables that we had last time. So now, sort of, the simplicial pattern is on the right-hand side of the colon as opposed to the left-hand side of the colon. And in general, uh, we're going to denote this as, on terms, you can also apply that matching operation. And this is going to be called a matching substitution. So for every term, uh, well, it's a partial substitution. A partial substitution in the sense that it's a section of a telescope. And a telescope is an iterated vibration. Um, OK, so key players are what? We have truncation, decollage, row. We have these matching contexts and matching substitutions, 
right? Okay, so matching quantics and matching substitutions. If we have something um, of dimension n um, in context pi gamma, so we want to do something in context gamma, which is an n-dimensional context, uh, we throw away the top dimension of gamma, and we give an n-dimensional type there. Um, in the context gamma n plus 1 in the discrete model, and we get a matching context built from the data of dimension up to n. And this is like fit to be a boundary for a n plus 1 simplex. Similarly for terms, start with an n plus 1 dimensional thing, project down, give a uh, section data there, uh, we get a substitution. That section is the previous matching context. OK, so now I can tell you what types and terms are. Basically, the idea is that a type is negative one-dimensional data, one zero-dimensional data, one-dimensional data, all the way up. So how do you inductively build it? Um, in simplicial model, n plus two is trivial structure, so there's nothing in dimension n plus two. Uh, sorry, negative two. Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking at dimensional data in n plus one, so at least starting at negative one, then you give a type in context pi gamma in the previous dimension, and that's pi a, is enough to build the matching objects, which is ripe to be the boundary of the n plus 1 simplex type. So the n plus 1 simplex types live in the context of the matching object of the previous dimensional data that you gave. So this just means to go from dimension n to dimension n plus 1, you add in plus 1 simplex types. So when you're, de you're defining the category with family structure. Yeah, I'm saying what the types are. I'm saying what, exactly. And I'm saying what the vibrations are. And you're like, doing it using like, you're doing like induction over like, like the matching object kind yep. of. Yep. And I'm going to define the matching objects yeah. inductively. And then for uh, what is a term? A term consists of the n dimensional partial substitution in dimension n plus one, and also the n plus one part of the section. So you build it up like a list. It's a list. It's literally a list, mm -hmm. an index list. OK, so how does context extension work? Remember, we have to know how to extend operations. So when you extend a pre-sheaf, um, so the line that matters is the second line. Uh, the idea is that like here, if we have a type A in dimension n plus 1, I've only defined how to evaluate it at the top dimension. So I have, I, if you have A, then I can form A n plus 1. If I want to form A of M for M less than N, then I should have to take pi a couple of times first and then access the top dimensional data. Um, so I, at the top dimension, if you have a type in simplicial model M plus 1 and you extend by a type, then at the top dimension, the way that you extend the top dimensional discrete context is by first extending by the matching object and then extending by M plus 1 simplices. And then in every previous dimension, we just take pi of stuff and apply the operation there. Um, but the fundamental idea is that to extend by a type, um, you're extending by all of the boundary of an n plus 1 simplex and then the actual n plus 1 simplex there. Um, so, and then similarly, if you're extending a substitution, uh, you basically do the same thing. Uh, at dimension n plus 1, you're extending the substitution by the matching partial substitution and then the n plus 1 component of the substitution. So now I've defined what the types and terms are, and I've defined how to extend um, contexts by a type and how to extend substitutions by a term. By the way, what I've given here is only the um, values of the pre-sheaf. I haven't given the morphisms in the pre-sheaf, and I won't do that in this talk. It's in the paper. Mm -hmm. So, decollage is a non-fibrant operation. Decollage is on pre-sheaves. We have a counterpart of decollage on types, and this is known as display. It is also going to be a shift operation, a backward shift operation, but because we're working in a context the way that you type, the backward shift operation is a bit more complex. So, if we have a type of dimension n plus 1, decollage gives something of dimension n, because that after all, it's a backwards shift. So we take the context gamma d, the decollage context. Now, a lives in context gamma. 
Um, pi A lives in context pi gamma, but we want something living in context gamma D, so we take pi A and we pull it back by the natural transformation rho gamma. Now it lives in context gamma D. So when you take display of a type, think of like gamma as a context of assumptions. Uh, Decollage is going to, as I'm going to say in a second, if you extend by a type and you decollage it, it doubles the extension. Um, so uh, decollage of gamma A is gamma D, then pi A rho gamma and A D. Um, so the key fact is that like um, A D, it depended on a bunch of things. Now it depends on twice as many things and also the uh, previous thing that you're defining shifted down in dimension by truncation. And so there's decollage on types and there's some terms. On terms, uh, we don't add that dependency into the context because we just um, already have T rho gamma. So this is the fibered counterpart of decollage, which Wait, was defined. Sorry. In um, the dependency in the context is the little a. And so it's, you're saying that you've got the context uh, with, uh, hit with the shift at the bottom and then also extended by a different shift of the type itself. Yeah, so the truncation shift and the backward shift. So the decollage type, the point is, depends on a, uh, in terms of, it depends on being like, lives in a context where you have a shifted undecollage type that, that sort of keeps yeah. you around so the, that's where I'm keeping yeah. around the stuff that the decollage yeah. is throwing away. The permanent is I'm just sort of like splitting vertex. It it out. Right. Right. So this is like I'm um, I'm it's like the barycentric explosion in a way, right? Like I'm not actually it's everything. I, I'm, I'm working with lower dimensional objects, but I've exploded out and kept mm -hmm. around the, all the pieces. Like I've taken the lid off the box and I've got the box and the lid. Yeah. Yeah. So, decollage, this fundamental operation that's an inherent operation on augmented semi-simplicial free sheaves, has a counterpart fibredly that's displayed. Mm -hmm. Vibrant stuff looks like type theory. Mm -hmm. We built an entire type theory around this operation. Mm -hmm. This operation is called display. The type theory is called display type theory. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is like this is like an IKEA instruction book. <laughs> right, that's my metaphor in my head for what's happening here. I, it, so the reading model construction is in the literature, but this construction that I'm about to present, two months of going preserve yeah. to find this construction. Uh, like, this was annoying, but it turns out to be really clean at the ends, and basically this classic things that exist in the literature, there's a construction of it that uses display and decollage in a fundamental way, and that tells you how to build a type theory for those diagram models. Okay, so matching contexts, we can define them inductively. Um, so in dimension, uh, starting with negative two-dimensional data, the negative one matching context is empty. Um, there's no boundary. A negative one simplex has no boundary. Uh, and what's the inductive formula elsewhere? Uh, so the n plus two matching object is the n plus one matching object of A, n plus one simplices of A, and then the n plus one matching object of A, D. And there's like a classic formula, if you think about augmented semi-simplices, that like explains this. There's a picture that I could have drawn. Um, but yeah, that's like inductively how you generate n plus one simplicity, boundaries of n plus one simplicities from boundaries of n simplicities. Or if you actually think about it and picture it, um, suppose you have the boundary of an n plus one simplex, like the boundary of a triangle, right? So you have three lines, three points in a page. You want to generate the boundary of a tetrahedron. So what do you do? So you take the boundary of a triangle, that's the first thing, mm -hmm. then you fill in the triangle, that's the second thing, and then you take a displayed triangle, mm -hmm. which is the other three places. Right. Ah, okay. So, so, it's, so it's, it's, it's decomposing the box into the lid and the rest of the box, and that's yep. how you move down the dimension. And right. so this generates the matching context that we want. This basically solves 
semi-simplicial types in semantics where it's set theoretics. So this is not a solution to semi-simplicial types. It's a solution to what is the pattern in a extensional, well, in a type theory with UIP. Wow. If we are in sets. So that's the explicit, that the, if you want the pattern, that is the pattern, but that pattern doesn't yet solve the problem in type theory, but later I'll solve the problem in type theory. And then similarly, basically same formula for matching substitutions. Um, great. So finally, display. What is display? Display is a backward shift operation. Um, so if we look at the right, in dimension n plus 1, uh, top dimension n plus 1 simplices of AD, where A is an n plus 2 dimensional object, or n plus 2 simplices. So it's a backward shift. n plus 1 simplices become n plus 2 simplices. This is at the top dimension of the respective things, and then elsewhere it just reduces to the previous shift. Uh, this is well typed. You can check that with this construction of matching objects. Um, remember when you extend a context by type, it extends by the matching context and then n plus 1 simplices. So the first two things are exactly a rho gamma in the context. And then like there's an implicit pi because A is already one dimension lower when you're constructing these matching objects. So like, and then you have the matching object of AD. So like it's in the perfect context, like this perfectly types the backward shift operation. So in summary, display is just the backward shift operation. It's not a complex operation. It's like, it, like you're assuming only augmented semi-simplicial semi retrieves. What can you do? Drop top stuff or shift downshift. I'm sorry. Is, 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 uh, there's normally two notions of decollage in the literature. Is like one of them uh, what you call decollage and one display, or is that? No. Um, so decollage is um, the uh, decollage is the backward shift operation on the non-fibered structure. Display is the backward shift operation on the fibered structure. So you're only you're only choosing one of the decollages. Yeah, so the second decollage would be okay, basically okay. Um, there's an undeletable vertex. Is the undeletable vertex the zero vertex in the ordering or the n vertex in the ordering? Um, that choice between the two operations of decollage was made when we defined decollage by putting the one here as opposed to at the end. So those are the two decollages. But this version corresponds to like really nice syntactic behavior that we want. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So there's a lot more that you need to construct a full categories with family structure. Like you need to define the functorial action on pre-sheaves. Everything has to be stable under substitution. This is like five pages in the paper to construct the fibrin structure and then one more page for variables. Um, I'm not going to show that in this talk, but what I've shown is that like the construction fundamentally uses display and decollage mm -hmm. to the extent that we can build a type theory out of it. Now, I'm going to describe that type theory on the next slide. So in general, in type theory, we also have like some structure on our model category. Like we have function types, we have universes, and in type theory, we assume universes. So there is a type of all small types. Mm -hmm. um, if we want to do type theory, we have to have universes around. I know most model category people don't, aren't used to having universes, but in an infinity topi, universes definitely exist. Uh, object classifiers. Our universes. Okay, so here is like a type. So I'm going to change the version of display, and this is a bit of a lie. Uh, a display of a type would usually be in the context gamma d extended by a row. Oh, also, I forgot to say, we are taking the limits of the truncated simplicial models. Uh, the truncation operation pi goes away because now in the limits there's no top right. dimensional data to drop. Um, so rho is now a natural transformation from decollage to the identity in the limits, so there's going to be no more pi. Pi just disappears when we take the limits. But like the limits, it's defined. I've defined the structure inductively at each level, so we just take the limit. Um, so usually AD would be in context gamma D with A rho gamma, but I'm actually going to abstract over that and then we turn into a function. This is technically a lie. This isn't what we do in the paper, but I'm just going to do it here. This is how it would work in a proof assistance. Um, so AD is a um, predicates on A. 
And then technically the context doubles and we use the even substitution. Um, and then for a term, uh, you get a proof of that predicate. Now the context changes oh, it's from gamma to gamma d. Um, is this syntax that you're building, is it like totally new or is it built out of other things in the literature? So display, as I'm going to get to, is a notion known as unary parametricity, um, which used to be a meta-theoretic thing. And then a bunch of people did internal parametricity theses, but our internal parametricity is different. We did it differently than everyone else did it, and that's why we got some superficial types. Wait, so I'm just trying to read this notation here. So when you say you're presenting something, what you've got is, uh, uh, so are these first four things at the top, they're, they're just um, syntax? So this is just like for any type, there is a predicate on it called AD. The context changes when you form AD. Okay. Um, for any term, there's a proof of that predicate. The context changes again. Uh, now, of course, if you're writing something, you can't just use D in the middle of a term and like get free variables out of thin air. So this is a major issue. So I'm just saying, so between yeah. the first and the second line, should I be reading uh, a bar? Oh, yeah, uh, this is, uh, there's an inference rule. Yeah, there. okay, that, that's what I was okay, going to say. That was, yeah. fine. The first two are inference rules. I could have typed out it like that. I was doing then a line star environment, yeah. so I just did it like that. Okay. Um, anyway, so this is the type of AD uh, on, and this is the type of TD. Uh, okay, so what is it on universes? So display is also known as dependency. So for example, in type theory, you have dependent types, right? So a dependent type is a dependent element of the universe. What is a dependent category? What is a dependent group? What is a dependent ring? In general, if you define any mathematical structure, then we've axiomatized what a dependent version of that structure is using this display operation. The first rule says that a display type is a dependent type, or in other words, a dependent type is a dependent type. So the notion of type dependency is like a special case of display on the universe. Right. Um, and for function types, um, think of, like, we're going to call AD the type of parametricity witnesses or computability elements. So the computability witness for a function from A to B is a function that takes computability witnesses over some x to computability witnesses of some fx. Um, for abstractions, it's double abstraction. For application, it doubles the application. Uh, here's the formula that we had before about decollage, and this is emphasizing that it's doubling the amount of variables. Display on a variable takes the primed variable, the twin variable that's introduced newly in the context. So display is fully computational. I haven't like talked about pi types and universes, but how we define them in the simplicial model is that we basically define them by the display formula. Because we've constructed everything so explicitly, um, we can just define it by the display formula, and then we can check that that definition satisfies the universal property of the structure for the pi type or universe. So display is fully computational in the type theory, and in semantics, it's fully strict. No coherence theorems require the computation theorems are definitional. Uh, now I'm going to say two things. So uh, I'm definitely way over time, and I'm only going to very quickly talk about semi-simplicial types. Uh, so for parametricity, this is going to be important for something that I say. If you have like a type of polymorphic identity function, so for all types A to A, an identity function on every single type. Right? So um, if you have this type, its type of parametricity witnesses is a proof that for all types and all predicates on the type, um, the function preserves the predicate. Now, if we have a term of type polymorphic identity, con um, identity type in the empty context, then we have a proof of its free theorem. The context doesn't change if you decollage it if it's a closed term. So we can get parametricity witnesses for closed terms at least. And I'm just going to say this very quickly. Uh, using path types, um, if you're able to take display, so I have a triangle box there. Um, because the context changes, we have to control when you can change it. So we actually have a modal type theory. It's in fact a multimodal type theory. Uh, I am not going to talk about modal type theory in this talk, um, but this basically is something that like essentially says it's a closed term. Um, so a thing that is true in the simplicial model is that every polymorphic identity function, or at least closed one, is in fact an identity function. You can prove it. This is going to be important later.
Also, what happens when we iterate display? Well, this isn't really surprising. It, everything is a triangle. Mm -hmm. You start with a type, you get like, that's, those are pages, then you get points on a page, then for every page and for every two points you get lines, then for every page and every three points and every three lines you get triangles, right? Mm -hmm. So, every, like, the point is we're working in a diagram model. What about the type theory tells us that we're working in a diagram model? How do we probe the diagram structure? Display is exactly the syntactic ingredient that we need to probe the diagram structure. So my thesis problem, to like put it playfully, is what is a triangle? What is a semi-simplicial type? And so now I'm going to be able to answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, in order to say what a triangle is, we're starting in some setting. And to say what something is means to give a universal property. So we want to give a universal property for semi-simplicial types in our starting model. The surprising thing is that it appears that semi-simplicial types do not have a universal property in the original model. Instead, what you do is you start from some notion of homotopy theory, some notion of spaces, some model categories, and you pass to the notion of spaces in which everything is a triangle. So you pass to the diagram model. Then, in the world of diagrams, there is a triangle of triangles, so to speak, and that has a universal property. So the universal property for semi-simplicial types isn't stated in your original setting, it's stated in the diagram setting. And then this diagram, you can take its discrete part down, and that will give semi-simplicial types in the original model. But the fact is that like, if we're trying to construct something in this model category, it doesn't look like we can do it in the original model category. We have to pass to a bigger setting, and then we have to assemble it in diagrams. Now, at first you may think, okay, well, assembling it in diagrams is like a strengthening of the inductive hypothesis. I've just assumed enough coherences to make it convenient to assemble. But it's more fundamental than that, because the universal property uses display, which only makes sense in the diagram model. So there's something fundamental about the universal property that you can only say it if you're working in a world of diagrams. Mm -hmm. So in the diagram world, okay, I have three slides on this because I ran out of slides, but I'm also totally out of time, so I'll wrap up in five minutes. <laughs> the definition of semi-simplicial type is three lines long. Uh, what is a semi-simplicial type? Every semi-simplicial type has a type of zero simplices. For every zero simplex in a semi-simplicial type, you get what you'd think of as another semi-simplicial type, but actually it's a dependent semi-simplicial type over the very type that you're considering. Or, or the very... So, okay. this is a co-inductive definition that uses display. Mm -hmm. This only makes sense in the simplicial model. Uh, and then I'm going to explain what this is in a picture. Uh, what's my second slide? Oh yeah, and then here's, I am basically about to wrap up. So the intuition is basically this. Uh, if you have a semi-simplicial type, there's a type of zero simplices. If you slice by the zero simplex, now you have a dependent semi-simplicial type. It's like a slice category. If you want to slice again, you have to slice by a pair of zero simplex and one simplex. And if you slice by that again, then if you want to slice again, you have to slice by a four tuple. So if you like work out how uh, Z, D, and Ed, how display works with Z and S, then like exactly syntactically this gives semi-simplicial types. Uh, do I have a last slide? No. So that's the end of my slides. So now let me get to the punchline of the talk. Um, so I talked about this parametricity and how like every polymorphic identity function in the simplicial model is in fact an identity function, right? So Think like a homotopy theorist. Um, if, as a homotopy theorist, we care about constructing a particular semi-simplicial type over a particular context gamma, right? We want to construct a semi-simplicial type, starting in our original model. Now, we don't have a universal property in the original model. So instead, we have to pass to the simplicial model. Now, to do that, we have to lift our object gamma to the simplicial model. And we can do so trivially in a co-skeletal way. So like, 